Can you hear me at the back? Is it on? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Ian Robertson. I'm a project director at Longest Chance um, and RFID guru, I think I said this morning. Um, now, you've heard me speak and you're probably thinking, oh, he flew in from London. Sorry, I drove up from Houston. So this morning you were told that they, you're either Texan or you want to be Texan. After 18 years here, I'm halfway. I, I'm almost accepted. And for those Texans here today, y'all fix and talk like a red neck. <laughs> Actually, because of my skin when that sun comes out, I'm the only true redneck around here. <laughs> right, so today um, we're going to talk about ROI modeling, specifically to do with RFID. Um, I think you got a presentation from my colleague Peter last August, I think it was, in Seattle. And Peter went through some of the business aspects of using RFID, specifically baggage tracking. I'm not going to repeat that with you today. Uh, what I am going to do, though, is to tackle an issue that's often getting in the way, which is how do you show your company that it actually would be worthwhile going forward with RFID? And actually, you should want to do that anyway. Because frankly, if you can't show that it's worthwhile, you shouldn't be doing it. Now, RFID is a great technology, but like all business changes, it's still got to be worthwhile. So having said that, a lot of people actually get hung up at that point and they say, well, how do we, how do we show the finance guys? Any finance people in the room? No? You're finance? Background. Oh, finance background. That's okay. If you're not in finance today, I can say this. How do we show the bean counters that it's worthwhile? Someone said earlier today, I think my... Uh, the uh, lady that presented before me said, if finance don't like it, it ain't going to happen. And that is very true. Very true. So you have to be able to show finance that you've done your homework and that the result is something that they think they're going to like. And that's actually one of the purposes of this whole model that we put together, is to be able to show finance the results in their terms. First of all, of course, before you model anything, you've got to understand what is the problem that you're actually going to go and try and solve. So in this case, I'm not going to spend any time on this. You guys know this better than I do. Actually, I know it quite well. I used to fly 340,000 miles a year. And so you can imagine how many times my bags have got lost. And I was, I was top tier in one of the airlines. I won't say which one. Um, so it's typically these things that happen that cause the lost bags. And someone said earlier, it's those humans. And typically it is. Not always. You can get a 3D barcode scanner go wrong on you. That's not a human problem, but they don't really go wrong that often. What happens when things go wrong with a mishandled bag? Actually, there's a whole series of consequences, most of which, or many of which, have been covered here today. But you've got to go and find the thing. You've got to actually get it back to the passenger. You may have to pay the passenger compensation if you've damaged it or can't find it at all. Here in the US for domestic, if you're beyond 12 hours or beyond 15 international, you've actually got to pay any baggage fees back to that passenger. Not to mention the whole business of having staff and infrastructure to do all of those things in the first place. So mishandled bags is quite a problem. And it's a very costly problem too. Which means that anything that we can do to reduce that, minimize it, you notice I didn't say eliminate, because I don't think we're ever going to do that completely, but I think we can get it down a lot. <coughs> so these are the things that we can do. 
very accurately identify bags and where they are. You can do that with barcodes. The, the problem is that, or well, the disadvantage of barcodes is you've either got to have some very sophisticated equipment or you've got to have a human being. And if you think about it, if you've got a human doing it, you're actually interrupting the process so that they can scan that bag. So as an example, if you're loading onto a belt loader at an aircraft, most of the time you have to line up. You'll see the guys, they're lining up to scan that bag, and then they can put it on the belt. One of the things with RFID, of course, is you just throw it on the belt. It's going to get read, whatever orientation it's in. So uh, you can do this. Uh, potentially, if you can do that, you can reduce the FTEs that you need to actually carry out the operation. Um, one very good thing is you get very accurate event data. So there was a slide earlier today that talked about the cycle time between some of the processes. You can achieve that with barcodes. The problem, though, with the barcode system is the barcode system doesn't necessarily tell you when a bag arrived at a certain point. It tells you when it was scanned there. The difference with RFID is it will tell you exactly when it arrived there. So you're getting more granular data. You don't have to have a human to scan it. <coughs> and I saw some really interesting stuff earlier about expanding the points at which we check to see where the bag is. That actually gets easier with RFID. And then improve the bag recovery and more timely corrective actions. So if you can do all of that, you can probably impact the cost quite a lot. Is it worth doing? Well, actually, it, to find out whether or not it's worth doing, you've got to go and look at some things like, well, how much is it costing you today? And you've actually got to break that down into the costs. Because when we go and impact the processes, you've got to know how much better you're making those processes and therefore in what ratio are you able to reduce the cost of that specific operation at that point. The other thing is that there's no point in modeling if you're not using the best data that you can. Now, my personal opinion is that the airline industry has actually got better and better at collecting its data over the last 10 years. Uh, and from what I've seen today, it looks like that will improve. But you need to get this data to understand where your costs are, because the better the data you put into the model, the better the answer you'll get out at the other end. Now remember, we're talking about the model. If I could tell you exactly how much you would save in the next two years, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be driving a Rolls Royce with GOD1 on the back. It's not possible. What the model is intended to do is to give you a better answer than that, or guessing, or using another favorite maths method of mine called HPP. Anyone familiar with that? That's hands, pen, and paper. You sit there and write it all out. I think we call it Excel today. <coughs> but setting up a model like this, as you'll see, is actually quite a sophisticated task. It, it does take quite an understanding of the process and it takes an understanding of spreadsheets and the math involved and some judgment about when you can guess and when you shouldn't. Try if I? Yes. Ah, there we are. So, bear, you can relax. I'm not going to drag you through the whole model. What I am going to show you is the structure that we used in putting the model, to, model the, uh, not the model, the model together. Um, so here you can see the incremental savings. So we look at those. Is this what I think? Sometimes it gets stuck. Sort of. Okay. So we look at the savings over here. Sorry that those of you over there won't see this. Um, we look at the reduction in the mishandled baggage and schedule optimization. You might be surprised to see that on there. Imagine you've got to do an offload passenger didn't turn up. Now today that's a pretty hmm, timely process, especially if you've got it, uh, a loose loaded aircraft. But if you could halve the time it took you to do that offload, potentially you're going to turn that aircraft around faster. And as you guys know better than me, if you've got an aircraft on the stand beyond a certain time, it's costing you money. 
Then you take away the incremental expenses that are involved in putting this technology into the process and getting the processes refined. That will then give you your net benefit. Now this is very, very high level. There's a lot of things in these headings here. There's a lot of detail. But you can see the structure is, I'll have a look at what I think I can improve. I'll take away what it's going to cost me to do that. That's my net benefit. Now, warning. Hazard warning. The data on the next slides is not real. Okay. It's really there as uh, just an example. It doesn't represent data from any airline. Well, airline A, actually, we called it because no one's called that. So what we do, and this is actually, uh, you can see part of the structure of the model there. What we do is we actually look first at some operational data. Now, you need that in the model. <coughs> For instance, if you've got an average cost per mishandled bag, we were talking about earlier, you need to know how many bags you're moving in a year. That's your total cost. And that's potentially the figure that you can reduce by X amount. So we actually look and we gather, for instance, what are ULD flights, what are loose loaded flights, because the process for loading them is different. So we make that differentiation. And we go all the way through number of domestic bags, number of international bags. And then we also go through all the costs involved. <coughs> this is the FTEs in your internal infrastructure, third party costs for instance, delivering the bag to the passenger, service fees, <coughs> I'm going to come to shortly, compensation, <coughs> and refunding of the baggage fees. All of those need to be in the model because they potentially uh, all can be impacted and they are your cost today. Uh, you can see here, this is so we'll just go through a quick example. This sheet, by the way, is a summary. This is a 10 year rollout where we take the things that I've just said. So we take all the costs and the, uh, we look at the savings that are potentially going to be there. We take um, away from those savings the cost of having the RFID system in there. And then we look at it. The reason for the 10 years is because your baggage volumes and passenger volumes, hopefully, will grow over that time. So to really construct the model properly, you have to put those adjustments year on year into the model, which is what we have done. You can see just this example. Uh, we used the $100. I, can't, I think we got it from Bank, I'm not sure, but we used the 100 just as an example. I think we found out earlier that it might be slightly different. And then what we do, uh, there's a very sophisticated <coughs> methods within the model for calculating what these totals are. So we didn't just take the totals out of the head and say this is what it is. You actually go through the process of looking at the processes, seeing what time and effort is saved, and of course that's all then multiplied by the operational stats that we have, and we come up with the totals. You can see uh, here all the refunds, the tracer services. If you've got lost bags reducing, then your tracer fees are reducing as well. And here is the incremental costs for putting the system in and a net benefit. As I said, these are dummy figures for airline A. Um, I haven't shown you the intricacies of the model. Uh, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't want to destroy your brain. <coughs> uh, if any of you are like, you would probably really enjoy it. Um, so if this is something that's of interest, then uh, the, the, uh, these are the guys to see. Annalene, my colleague, is actually here with us today. I think Peter's going to be here tomorrow. I know that many of you know Peter. Um, these are the guys to talk to. I'm just the mechanic behind the thing. Um, but it's really, really helpful. The intricacies of the model uh, I should have added here is this model is an OPEX model. It is based upon the whole thing being provided as a service with a fee per bag. Now we also have another version of the model which is a CAPEX model which is where we go through now for the finance person in the room 
amortization, NPV, all of that stuff, all the stuff that makes people's head hurt, it's all in there. All right. Because when you're going to a CapEx model, one of the things you have to make sure is that the project's going to give you the return that you need for the lifetime of the capital equipment you're going to have. Most of you, I'm sure, bought a new car, only to find that the second you've driven it off the lot, it's gone down by 25%, the value. And so, you know, this is what happens with capital equipment. So there is another version of the model. Um, I would say that it might be an attractive model, the OPEX one, for the airlines, given that you already have a very capital intensive business. So any questions at all? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much.